Hey guys, what's going on? It's Brian. I'm back again with another episode of the podcast. Today, I'm really excited to welcome on an amazing guest, a really inspiring person, uh, one of my buddies for several years now from the dance industry and just coming up dancing in New York. Uh, he's an awesome guy. James Combo Marino is a professional dancer from LA, uh, originally from Connecticut, but now out in LA and dancing professionally for several years now. Uh, he's gone on to do really incredible things, dancing with some of the biggest artists in the industry, Mariah Carey. Uh, he just danced with Justin Timberlake on the Oscars, and we actually sit down and talk about that experience because dancing with Justin was basically his biggest goal, his biggest dream uh, when he first started dancing, and he accomplished it. And it's a, a culmination of eight, almost nine years of work and dedication and perseverance and commitment and... Uh, it's really interesting to talk to someone who's been able to accomplish something they've put in their mind to do for so long because you can kind of deconstruct the processes and the habits they use to get there and it can be beneficial to you. So I hope you guys enjoy this interview. Uh, James is an awesome guy, not only just as a performer and now you know a choreographer and a teacher, but he's also a really well-rounded person, someone who's very deeply rooted in being a student and wanting to educate themselves and... Uh, basically remove any ignorance that exists as much as they can. Uh, he's committed to learning. He's committed to personal growth. And it's something that's very inspiring. And a person that I count among uh, the friends of mine who definitely inspires me to do better myself. So really excited to share this interview with you guys, this conversation I have with my buddy James Marino. Hope you guys enjoy. Also, all uh, links to his social profiles and where you guys can find him online will be in the comments section of this episode. Most of the social media networks use James Combo Marino or James Marino, but I'll leave all the links, the links uh, below for you guys so you can look them up. <laughs> Yo, so what's going on, James? What's up? Dude, not much, man. I mean, uh, I'm just cruising right now. I've been you know, busy performing and trying to check things off my list performing-wise, but um, yeah, man, I've been teaching at the same time and everything. I'm just trying to keep my time uh, as busy as possible with stuff that I want to do and everything that, all the hard work that I put in a place, you know, in the past eight years with this dance thing is finally, finally feeling like it's just evening out. Is that how and long you, something. is that how long you've been dancing now, eight years? Professionally, yes, eight years. Um, well, I mean, training even professionally, yeah. So it, probably around 10, I mean, I danced in high school, but it was like for fun. I danced to get the girls, man. That's why I started dancing. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't understand, I didn't understand the art form until I was about uh, 19, 20 years old. And I'm 29 now, so. Okay. Nice, man. So you just basically fulfilled your main goal and vision, like the whole reason you moved out to LA. How does that feel? The whole reason I danced, period, man, like, it, it, Well, tell, it, say, it, say, it, just, it, like, give an overview, real. yeah, give an overview of what happened. Like, what did you just do? So, I was blessed with the opportunity to perform with Justin Timberlake on the Oscars, no less. Um, That's so, so crazy. basically, two big, huge um, goals checked off at the same time. Amazing. Um. It was the first musical performance that has ever opened up the Oscars, uh, and we are the first performance to get a standing ovation. No shit. I didn't know that. It's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it was incredible, man. Like, I, we finished, and literally I walked off, and I was like, I need to do that again right now. <laughs> like, right now. That was way too short, way too... Uh, the uh, it, it, I can't even put it into words. I, I still... I, it's funny because uh, everyone since I finished it everyone's been hanging up I want to hear about it I want to hear about it and I haven't spoke to that many people about it because I'm still trying to understand what happened myself right Pro trying to process because, it yeah I'm trying to process it because man like literally the reason why I started dancing is, is JT and yeah. um, I, I don't really uh, you know it's one of those things where you put as your goal you know you move out here but I mean I missed when he was coming out you know in his prime he's still amazing right he's so refined now right but you know my men, my mentors uh, Eddie Morales and uh, soon to be like Marty Judelka uh, they danced for him in his prime you know they 
created, helped create his career. Yeah, so, they basically helped him. They created that movement, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so basically the movement inspired that whole, you know, generation. Yeah. I, uh, so it's like, you, you know, you, you hope to dance with it, but it's one of those shot in the dark dreams where right. it's like, you don't even know if you're still going to be performing when you get to a certain age. You don't know if you're going to have the experience that's necessary by the time, you know, like, you just never know what can happen. But um, I just, I, basically the way I went about it was if I get it, I get it, and I'm going to do everything I can to keep that option open, but I'm not going to close the other option. Right. right. So basically it's one of those things where it's like, you know, shoot for the stars and you land on the moon type of thing. Right. But luckily I hit one of those stars. Right. You know? Right. I just, got the opportunity from all the time that I've been putting in for, you know, taking the, the classes that I need to take, training with his choreographer, um, spending time listening to his music and being around the people that are around him and, and studying what they do. And man, just all of that work is just finally, when I got that, that, that phone call and that email, I was, I, dude, I literally cried. I can't, I do. I can't even imagine, man. And you know, it's crazy. Like I'm almost looking at it from like a, more like metaphysical perspective like you proved to yourself in a subjective sense that you could make a decision about something you wanted to do and the only thing separating you from that and it happening was just a period of time and a certain amount of effort but but when you look back on it you don't feel every single minute you were you know in class and training and all those things it really feels like you just did some type of magic trick you know what I mean which is why I why I can't understand it yet mm-hmm. and that's what I'm kind of like the man the whole story of how what goes into this and the first people that ever taught my dance steps um me any dance steps were these two kids um one in particular and one in particular his name was Scott Kavanagh um and Phil Dyson they're from my hometown East Hartford I remember I was a freshman going to my sophomore year in uh, high school and they were the first ones that put me up on dancing and they actually died in a car crash that year. No shit, and, man. That's horrible. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And that was their dream. You know, they, they loved dancing and, uh, you know, I kind of picked it up from them. And so I have all these ulterior things that people don't know. It, it's not just, oh, I like dance and I like just music and it, it, it was all that built up. Yeah. Yeah. There's something deep and within you, you know, that's like driving you. Yeah. You know, it's like, Man, you know if they can't do it anymore, so I'm gonna do it for them type of thing. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, man. That's yeah, it's so crazy. And it's interesting how like I was talking to someone the other day how you can't always see when you're going through it in the moment how everything eventually when you look back at it whether it's you just ascribing order or their order actually being there you know who cares which one it is but when you look back at things you can see like the dots connecting and it makes you can see how you how you ended up where you were but looking forward you can oh. you can never see that so it must be trippy for you to look back and just see all of these interconnected like what patterns have you seen that's like led you up to this you know well i think that you can see it you there's still room for variables that can shift it but there's a reason why certain people get to where they're getting it's because of their plan right it's their plan to action right you know so they might not like i said they, they might not get their exact goal right. but if they follow certain steps and instructions yep. they're going to get close enough where it's fulfilling totally you know what I mean absolutely man um, so I do think that everything that I put out there you know I I, I can see the dots connecting and I can see why I was in the position to be able to to land such a thing that was it's funny because when I was doing interviews for the paper um, that was one of their questions and, and most people that were uh, messaging me on Facebook one of their main questions was how did you pull it off? How did you get this gig? <laughs> and literally, my, my answer is, they're like, did you audition for it? I was like, no. I've been auditioning for this gig for eight years. Right. I remember taking Marty Kudelka for the first time at Monsters in Connecticut eight years ago. Eight, yeah. nine years ago. Yeah. You know? And that, from there on, I was like, oh. And I tried everything since then. I tried so hard to get in space in my, in my early years in L.A., and it just was time, man. It was putting in the time, and dude, and it was so such a blessing because even though I was frustrated, he made me work for it so hard because I think he just wanted to see me improve. 
improved and get better at stuff. And that's made me have to the dancer I am today. Because all the people that were like, you're not ready yet. Yeah. And I was frustrated at the time. But when looking back, I see that it helped attribute to my hunger for improvement. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, man. Like, I've always, <clears throat> I've always felt this, like, kind of connection or affinity for you in particular as another dancer because it was like I remember we were doing Emmy Motivating Excellence and it just I just like I saw a lot of the similar characteristics that I have as far as how I like to really push myself hard and like I kind of I have like this no we both kind of have this no bullshit attitude like just show up and do the work like don't don't bitch to just make just do what you need to do you know what I mean and um, I've always really appreciated that. And it's crazy to see because I've been watching you progress over just the last couple of years, like on a lot of social media, just seeing you get more present in there and, and push yourself further in your craft. And by Marty, like not giving you this gig until now, it's forced you to become this beast, honestly. Like you're fucking sick, dude. Um, Thanks, man. I yeah. That. Yeah. Man, I miss those Emmy days for sure. I know. It was so much fun, man. That was like, that was such a crazy time because that was the first time, I don't know about you, but that was the first time for me that I did any type of like extended training program or anything like that, you know? Dude, I didn't even know what dance was until I did the dance program. I know. Like, I knew it was watching it, but like everything that I was doing, I was self-trained. Right. Um, I, I, I learned from watching music videos. I was a soccer player my whole life, man. Like, I should dance until I was 90 years old at the highest level, you know? And that was when I got into it, and I was just, I think my work ethic was what made, made Rhapsody kind of, like, see me. Yeah, totally. And then, bro, like, I literally, when we were learning all this stuff, it's because I progressed so fast because I just wanted it so bad. Right. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no this training, that's why I was so fortunate for it because I, it, it translated what I used to do for soccer mm-hmm. into now what I need to do for dancing. Mm-hmm. Just constant drills, repetition, learn this way, learn that. It, yep. it was just like, it was, it was home for me with just another subject. Yeah, man. And what it, we had, we got like, that was, when we when I think back at like what we all paid for that, <laughs> it's like, oh, no. it's the most, it's the most, oh, re- ridiculous deal like of all time to get Rhapsody for six hours a day for three months and then and then another like two months ish and then a show like yo you know what's funny is literally I think if I like book a huge commercial I'm getting really close I might just even pay her back for all the time that I should have paid her for that would because <laughs> it is, uh, she literally changed my life I know she made yeah. me see everything yeah, you she, know, yeah. and then I was fortunate after her to, to work with Eddie Morales, and I started assisting, becoming his assistant, yeah. um, the first assistant ever. And then both of them together, their mind and their movement, uh, that's literally what uh, helped me progress so quickly. And and I, I read about this all the time, man. You know me, I studied millionaires, and, yep. and I studied business world just as much as I do dance world. Same and here, man. Every book that I read, man, you know, it's just mentor find a mentor is like the number one uh what can i say how do i explain it the number one uh not criticism but like the piece of advice yeah yeah find Absolutely. a mentor and do because i used to want to do it all myself yeah because yeah. i wanted all the credit i was like no i'm gonna work hard myself i don't need this whole lot and then i was like one after i did the program and i started to be able to get under people who just had eons of experience over me i would just it was I was a sponge I just thought they did, and I was like, oh my, God, I would have never learned this by myself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Man, such a crazy, a crazy ride. So, so you did this thing, and, you know, you've reached this, this moment. And I remember, you know, I went on your Facebook, and I posted a comment, and I said uh, something along the lines of, like, like, really soak this in, because... What happens in life and what I've noticed in my life and I'm sure you've noticed in yours is like when you get this thing that you've been wanting for so long, pretty shortly afterwards, you start asking, okay, well, what's next? You know? Uh-huh. And it doesn't take anything, any value away from what you just did because what you just did this is this crazy, awesome accomplishment. You've, you've really like 
got to that goal. But now, like, what are you thinking? Like, what's what's in your mind now as far as like how you feel about dance and how you feel about your place in it and, and what you want to do? Or if, have you even thought about that at all? Are you just kind of still soaking it in? Like, where are you uh, at? No, I, I'm, I'm doing all of the above. Um, well, this year in particular, like every year that I moved out here, you know, um, for myself, I'm very proud of my progression. You know, I'm not, I'm not one of the top working dancers, but um, how I've built my resume and my experience in just the short five years that I've been here totally. with having no prior dance knowledge and experience and networking, um, I'm very proud of how far I've come. Um, and to be able to, like I said, what I had on my vision, actually, I have a vision board, and a lot of people stack it with as much information as possible because they just want to put everything out there. Yeah. Mine is six things, and five of them pertain to lifting and working out and creating my own variety. And the only thing that ever had to do with the job is a picture of Justin Timberlake. So, like, my vision toward it was very, very tunnel vision because I knew whatever else I got was extra. Yeah. So that's how I feel now. Now that I I've reached that point where I did what I need to do. I'm, I'm so, uh, it, it's almost like a weight is off my shoulders, and now I can just be so free that whatever comes, whatever comes, and I'm going to be happy. I'm just going to, I've always kind of been the person who I want to do jobs that I, I really enjoy doing. I've turned down a lot of jobs that I didn't see myself doing because I didn't care about the money. Absolutely. Um, and now I see myself doing it even more. Yeah. So, I did soak in every minute, man. I remember before rehearsal, I used to remind myself how lucky I was. And when I left, I used to remind myself how lucky I was and what I experienced and who I got to see uh, create and, and watch dance that day and how Justin was in the rehearsal process, how the show process was. I mean, the whole camp was, everybody's incredible and everybody's a good person, which I care about first. Yeah, man. Um, so it was a super enjoyable experience. That's awesome. And but, it's like... Yeah, but... Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. It's cool to hear you talk about uh, like focusing on because what I'm hearing as you're saying that is just like this focus on gratitude, and then also with the vision board thing, like it, you you basically put just systems and processes on the vision board, which is what which is what inevitably gets you to wherever you want to go. It's not this giant carrot; it's the whole process it takes to get there. So it's cool that you. That's I've never heard someone who's done a vision board where like they put just the practical, tactical things you have to do every day to get where you need to go. You know? Yeah. That's literally what it focuses on, man. Like I didn't want to say award show this, well, that's gonna come. I'm not worried about I'm I'm never worried about what the job is gonna be or what it is. Because that I can pick and choose. But if I'm not even talented enough or if I'm not in shape enough, right. It doesn't matter what the job is because I'm not even gonna be adequately adequate adequately equipped to perform to my best ability yep. and that's what I care about the most Yep, is not just getting the job and showing up on Instagram I want to get the job and kill the job as best my ability so that way I can understand where I need to go from there to get better for the next one dude the way the way you found that camera moment when he was walking down the stairs and you were like brushing your hair back or whatever it was, yeah. that's such a oh man that's like such a great camera moment to catch you know were you aware of, were, were you looking for the camera or did that just happen that just just out of the blue i'm not gonna lie okay so we had a couple run throughs we didn't have that many run throughs on stage um and each time they were recording it it was different they had different cuts they had different um angles they were trying to catch them at so i knew it was there but when we started to perform like the day that it was on yeah blacked out heavy. I'm not going to lie. I blacked out heavy. Because even that section, like in rehearsal, um, Justin would look a different way every time we did it. Sometimes he wouldn't even look, but like we knew we were going to stop on an eight, look, ball, change. Right. And that was set after like after we did it a couple times in rehearsal. I did it by accident one time. He's like, yo, yo, I like that. Let's keep it. So like, oh, fresh. Okay. And we are going down the stairs. So I was like, in my head, I was like, you know what? There's going to be a camera moment because he's coming down the stairs with only three or four other people. Right. So the, if anything, the only cutaways they'll do 
it will be to like you know one of the celebrities, but they're not going to cut away to a why because there's no more dancing going on, on stage. Right. So I knew that would be a moment for me. So that's why. So then, luckily, he looked at me on that. After that eight, we looked at each other, and then when I ball changed up and there, I did find the camera real quick. So I was like, it's got to be here. If they cut, they cut. It is what it is. So I'm gonna try my best to make this, you know, that moment for me. That's awesome, man. And, for, and, not, and not just for me, but for the show. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. No, I get it. But it's just that it's like, because you know, you know, you have no control over that. And to be, you know, to be aware of where the cameras are when you're in it is such a tough thing to do, too. And also be aware of everything else that's going on around you. And it's like your spatial awareness just gets so dialed in when you're doing that type of stuff. It has to be because, it has to be. yeah, it's just so. It's so crazy. Like I remember, uh, I did this gig with Carly Rae Jepsen on um, the Today Show or Good Morning. Uh, I think it was GMA. Oh uh, well, it was. I did. I did New Year's Eve too. But the but the time I'm thinking about is on GMA because, like, for whatever reason, I totally like. This is my. I look back and when I'm critical about myself, I'm like, man, you fuck, you messed that part up. So she starts like, where there's this part where where me and Mikey are supposed to go for it on stage and as we're going forward on stage she just decides to fucking randomly walk to the left directly in front of me so i have to like adjust and go way further uh stage left and when you watch the playback what's supposed to be framing carly ray jepsen is now like mikey framing carly ray jepsen and brian like 10 feet <laughs> to the left so uh, it's tough man okay, I got you what you're saying. it's hard to do it is. Yep. And I, I did pretty well on that TV performance, which I'm super proud of. But like, then I learned so much when I went on tour with her. Right. Space, learning space because learn you never like we honestly never knew where she was gonna go. Yep. She just got up on stage. And oh, did bro! Her thing. You're you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah. You know, but the thing is, like, I love her though. Like, I was never for me. I, I never saw it as a negative thing. Like, no, so, no, like, no. It's like, just thought, uh, yeah. It's just for, you know. For me, it's like, and this is something that Eddie taught me. He goes, man, like. Think about it. When you have an artist that is always going to hit their mark, you know how easy that's going to be because right. you have this experience of it was an audible every single time on stage. You right. never do where you're going to be. Right. Not one. Right. So that training now that's why, like, even when you see me in class, like even before, yep. man, like I go all over the floor because I am so used to that. I don't need to stay in my one spot because sometimes that spot won't work. You have to be able to switch. People don't realize this dance thing. And, and people, they, they don't get credit for it, but it is just like being a doctor in terms of your critical thinking fast in your feet. Like, oh, hell yeah. Like doing surgery. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and people don't realize that yet because if we mess up, somebody doesn't die. But, right. you know, there's a, there's a different level of, you know, how important it is. However, the difficulty in it is just as difficult. Like, because... Those are the things that separate a true professional and somebody who really gets it from somebody who's still trying to learn it. Totally. You know? Yeah. And even people that really get it, even people that really get it, they'll still mess up from time to time just because of the situation. But the ones that can fix it faster, they just get it more. Totally. Yeah. And that's like the never-ending journey, right? It's like it's impossible It's impossible to reach perfection, but you can get to a point where, you know, like I watch someone like – a Jillian Myers or a, or a Devin Jameson or, you know, some of these people and you just, you see like that's, that's a hundred, you know, that's 50,000 hours of practice. That's like, I'm, I'm, like I'm looking at, yeah, like I'm looking at 50,000 hours of someone doing one thing, you know? Um, dedicated, of oh, dedicated practice. Yeah. Not, the, the, and the, there's a difference, man, like, and, the, how honed in they are with their art. Those are two dancers that are just unbelievably, they're, they're artists, you know? Yep. And that's something I'm still striving for. I still think I'm just a dancer. I, I think I'm a good performer, but I'm trying to understand even more the artistry side of it. Totally, because um, there is that next level. I said, because there is that next level. Like, there's a definite difference. Like, yeah. you, can, you can see when you look at when you look at a dancer who is like really fucking dope and great, but then you watch someone who's like that's an artist, like that's mm -hmm. true mastery. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, and, and, yeah, absolutely. And you can see it. And I don't think I'm there yet. I think I'm great for That's why I love tours and concerts because you don't have to tell a story as much. Right. Um, it's more about, you know, and you still have to be really talented to perform at those high levels. And that's a lot of pressure, you know, when you're in front of 50,000 people. Um, so it's different. But I want to, now that I know I can rock that side, that artistry side, um, where it's more about storytelling, I want to start tapping into that. Yeah, I'm I excited to see well, you get into that, man. That side, like when you watch people that really know how to do that, and then also attack the side, man, it, you can't you can't say anything to them. They're yeah. incredible. Absolutely, and I think what's really cool is, uh, I think a lot of people could identify with the feeling that you're having right now, where you kind of feel like that weight is lifted, where it's not like like you you have nothing to prove to anyone. You know what I mean? And and be, and because of that, you're free to actually actually get somewhere, you know, to actually be able to to find like whatever that inner voice is that's going to artistically push your stories further. I think it's going to be really cool to see your progression, you know. I com- I completely agree with that too, and I think that I've been not limiting myself for so long, but I, I do train in a lot of different styles, and I try. I'm always training, you know. In, in something. I'm always studying or training something. Totally. But, you know, to be able to accomplish goals, you have to be streamlined a little bit in your in your approach, like we were saying earlier. Um, but now that I kind of got that, that's kind of there, and I know it's there, but now I have more freedom to do other stuff because I know I can always tap into what I already did. Right. So now I'm excited, like I said, to maybe take some risks. And, and create some controversy, even with myself. Because I really don't care. If you like my choreography or not, I don't care. I like it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm the one dancing it. Right. And so it's like, for me, I don't need everybody to like it. And nobody's going to like everything. No. You know? No. Um, so I stopped caring about that. Because I used to get not bothered by that a little bit, but like every artist, you're sensitive about your stuff. Yeah. And you want to be just you want to be uh, just as much of a voice as anyone else is. Right. Um, and because of my, my style and my pattern and approach, it took me a little while to build myself up. But now I think the way that I've done it, I'm so confident in what, the, what I do that I'm not second guessing it anymore. I'm just doing it. If you like it, cool. Come ride with me. If not, cool. I'll see you then. Like, no hard feelings. It just is what it is. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So other than, uh, other than just dance, like what else have you been into and up to? Man, I'm really working on my fitness right now. Um, I've been trying. I mean, I, I was getting back into it, and then in the beginning of the year, since January first, man, I've been working every single week. So my diet has been very poor. Um, not in terms of what I'm eating exactly, but how much I've been trying to uh, mm-hmm. stay consistent with yeah. that part. And the eating part is always the hard part for me. I can work out all day. Yeah. But now I'm trying to get a little more disciplined with my food intake. Um, I'm trying to do uh, it's a balance of things. I'm not trying to put too much on my plate. I'm really, you know, like doing the I was doing the ketogenic diet last year for a little bit, um, and it worked amazing when I was on it. But I was losing a little bit of weight. I was shredded. Yeah. But I need to, to gain a little bit. So um, I'm, I was trying to eat more, and then when I started, to get, you know, taking in more carbs, dude, I started getting a little fat. I'd never been fat in my life, so yeah. I was freaking out. So I stopped it. <laughs> and, Right now, I'm just really disciplined to find the balance of the fitness. Because, because, like I said, the reason before, too, because I was trying to chase dance so much, even though I know I like the lift, but I know I, if I got, let's just say this, if I got a better body in terms of being big or in her poems, I actually wouldn't be working more than a dancer. I don't even think twice about that. Yeah. But I never wanted to work because of my look. Right. Which people always used to criticize me. They're like, dude, it doesn't matter. You should be working. But, but I, never, I didn't care about that. Right. I was like, yeah, I could do that, but I wanted to get better at my craft and be respected for my dancing first. Yeah. And like I said, now that I feel like I've got that, okay, cool. Yeah. Commercials and movies and whatever else. Totally. Um, and that's a big focus of mine right now. So what are you? What kind of diet are you doing right now? Because honestly, what one of the things that I think is, if you said you like the ketogenic diet, but you just wasn't able to, you know, keep enough weight on and then eating a lot of carbs is bloating you well, you could try the slow like the slow carb diet that tim ferris thing oh, it's, yeah. it's pretty tim good Ferris, yeah 
It's pretty good. It's pretty easy to follow. And, uh, well, yeah. What I'm doing right now is, so because I was so restrictive and I am a very disciplined person, so once I get on something, it is what it is. Um, I want a little. I want to be a little more free. Um, like for example, uh, like for a long time, man, I didn't have any sugar in my diet. Yeah. Um, and you know, you, I feel amazing, and it's you know it's incredible. And anytime I can, you know, get on a diet where it's like, okay, not not this, I eat healthy, I'm not eating this, I'm not eating that, no fried foods, blah blah blah. It's great. I can stay on it. It's easy. But I want to have a little bit more freedom of getting so hard on myself. Yeah. Um, so right now, I'm actually because I feel pretty confident in how I look right now, and I feel like I am actually progressing really uh, quickly with my look. Um, and it just can, and actually uh, the whole idea of the minimum effective dose of the gym. Yeah. Dude, I used to go to the gym for two hours before. I hit the gym for thirty minutes and I get out of there. Yeah, man. And yeah. I, I'm not gonna lie, bro. I have so much more time to do other things, and I look the same, if not better. Yep. And you have you have less you have uh, less nagging injuries too, um, yeah. And yeah, dude, I do the same thing. I, I do kettlebells. I do like a solid fifteen minutes, twenty minutes max, and I'm and I'm gassed, you know. Oh, and uh, kettlebell, you do the kettlebell swings. Yeah, I do. I have a progression that I do. It's like uh, I do two handed swings. I do these uh, renegade rows. So like you have the two kettlebells. You do a push up. You basically uh, one arm row on one push up one on row on the other then you jump into a bottom squat position you rack them stand up press squat and then just repeat so i'll do like a like a circuit of a couple different things for 15 or 20 minutes and by the end of it i'm drenched and just done Dude, um, i might need you to send me that because after this first phase of this you know initial thing that i'm doing i might even want to jump onto that yeah, it's simple, and it's what's that good is amazing. yeah, and it's all functional movements too. So you're using your entire body, so you're less likely to get injuries because no, you're not going to be out of balance. Um, yeah. So it, between that and yoga, uh, that's like been keeping me in great shape. Now that I'm not dancing full time anymore, it's it's really uh, it's really really helped. So I think yoga is a good one too. Have you ever done that? Yoga is the key to life, bro. <laughs> it's the key to life. Nice. It really is. It man. is, like, man. Once you, I remember, and I'm not. I got to get back on that myself, and I'm better at it lately because like, when I teach at the university, I stretch with the kids a lot, so I always stretch at least. Uh, I'm stretching about four or five days a week now, at least. Nice. Um, I'm not gonna lie, man. Like before, I used to stretch a lot, and now before dance class, dude, I barely stretch. Because I was reading a lot of studies about your physical uh, performance. Yep. And when you overstretch before you do explosive movement, you know, you lack a little bit. Absolutely, and you actually make yourself more injury prone too if you do too much static stretching, stretching before whatever you're doing. Yeah, so I just do a little warm up here, and I, you know, just enough. I, I know my body well enough now that I know what I can do and I can't do. Right. Um, and I know what I can push and what I can't push. So I, I, I'm, I got a good command of that now. But when I was stretching, and I was stretching like before bed, dude, I used to be able to wake up. Every morning, with I was stressed for a thirty minutes to a half. I mean, sorry, thirty minutes to an hour. I would wake up the next day feeling like I slept for 25, 26 hours. Yeah, yep. literally, with yep. no alarm clock. Yep. at six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning, refreshed. When I didn't stretch, I would wake up groggy and tired. And last night, I actually just did it again for the first time, and I, I can't believe I did this. I teach at a university at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's, for me, that's kind of early, but I've been trying to wake up early, so I like it. Mm-hmm. It gets me up. Um, because it's LA traffic, I gotta leave at at least eight o'clock, or I won't get there on time. Right. So I always get there like six thirty. Right. I went to bed last night at probably two o'clock. I was watching a little TV show. I just got into Shameless, by the way. Um, it's pretty good. I've seen so it. Hooked. <laughs> hooked, bro. It's so different than my lifestyle and how I see things. So I'm hooked on that. I know. Um, <laughs> I know. It's insane. I watched that for, you know, one of the episodes, and then I usually set my alarm, you know, on my phone, and I get up whenever. I fell asleep last night. I had, I had stretched before I watched the show, yeah. and I fell asleep. I woke up this morning, sunny as can be, <laughs> and I, I hit the panic, panic button in my head. 
because I thought I slept through class. Right. I turned over and I looked at my phone, 6.38. Oh, that's amazing. And I literally credit that to the stretching that I did before I went to sleep. And I woke up like ready to go. I wasn't like, oh, I need to sleep for another 30 minutes. Yeah. I got up right at 6.38, like to brush my teeth and just got ready for the day. Yeah, man. It, it's uh, there's there's a lot of biological reasons for it too. I mean, there's tons of different factors. Obviously, you're you're breathing deeply, so you're circulating a lot of blood and oxygen through your body, and you're lengthening your muscles. And you're like, a lot of times, what a lot of what sticks our muscles up and what makes us have these like little strains and stuff is fascia, which is which is what covers the muscle. It's like this it's this thing that's that's covering your actual muscle fibers, and it can get matted up like almost like a dirty dog's hair and uh stretching kind of works those mats out and what you're doing by breathing and, and circulating all that blood through is you're bringing about a lot of nutrients a lot of like immune precursors like stuff that's going to like take out the inflammation so it makes sense that if you do that before you go to sleep you're going to just have a deeper sleep and your your body's probably going to have less that it has to repair or less of a yeah. process of having to repair it, so you can spend more time in like actual like REM rapid eye movement, you know, deep restorative mm-hmm. sleep. Um, it makes sense, yeah. So and that's I awesome. think that, and I think that just for overall humans in general, they should be doing it. But I think I also contribute a lot of my work ethic is to taking care of my body, man. Yeah. Like I, I thankfully don't have that many injuries, and I played sports my whole life. I mean, I have feeling a a few things, but when people are like, oh, I don't feel like I used to feel when I was 23. Yeah, I'm 29. I don't, I don't hear, I don't feel that yet. Like a lot of people that are even younger than me are saying that, and I don't understand it. I'm like. You know what I think why it you, is. Why are you so tired? You know what I think it is, though. I think it's try. I think it's. Uh, overall consistency because I feel the same way and I've did you know I did martial arts for like 10 years I started I was went into dancing so you and I have pretty similar like background as far as how physical we've been and I think I think it's just doing making it part of your lifestyle and doing it for a long period of time is just going to preserve your body better than other people and also you have to consider like a lot most people went through a really long period of their life if if they're not still doing it where they ate pretty much all fast food they they don't really understand anything about nutrition you know they think they're eating like the traditional way their family has eaten which might not be terrible but it might also be just all like mashed potatoes and gravy and turkey you know what i mean and um yeah. you're a product of what you're around so that catches up to you and then by the time you're 30 when you're getting a little bit older and stuff is starting to you know, not break down, but show signs of you're not 16 anymore. It's more brutal on you because you have all this accumulation of just putting bullshit in your body. And that's not to judge anyone yeah. for their for their choices, but it's like, you know, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. For sure. Uh, oh, absolutely, man. Like, yeah. even uh, I'm talking to my friends that are, they'd be so stubborn about their diet. Like, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you eat. I feel great. I exercise. And I'm like, okay, bro. Like I'm so thankful my mom was such a healthy eater. Uh, if she ever knew that we you know we ever ate McDonald's, she would lose her mind. Really? She would lose her mind. Oh yeah. So I'm so thankful that she was she did that. And also my grandmother was, you know, I have an Italian grandmother, she used to cook everything. So always fresh, always the fresh food. So I'm super thankful that I grew up around that. That's but awesome. um yeah, it's it, now I have friends that are finally changing their diet and I see their posts on Instagram. I, I'm, I'm Facebook and they're like, what was I doing for 20 years? <laughs> you know, what was I doing for 25 years? I have never felt this good in my life. Yeah. And it just goes to show you, I see a lot of people have been, you know, like you said, pulling things off it, it, even though they're eating bad, they're eating whatever. Yeah. Can you imagine what they would be capable of if they ate properly? Oh my gosh, dude. It speaks to the, the resiliency of the human body, like this amazing machine that we have that's so adaptable that it can literally learn to exist almost entirely off of alcohol, you know? Yeah. Like there's alcoholics who barely eat any actual food and they're still up and walking around. I mean, granted, they're in horrible health, but they're still kicking, you know? Yeah. And, and the resiliency. Find the way to make it work. It's, it's, it's insane. It's insane. And I think a lot of people just get used to feeling the way they feel and they think, you know, people go through life just experiencing what they experience. So they, they take for granted 
their experiences as all there is. Like they don't understand, you know, they don't see like they could actually feel better. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's huge. A hundred percent. That's huge. Because you, your perception is, is all, your own personal perception is you can only understand what you've been through. Yep. So especially when it has to do with like how your body feels, man, you have no idea what you're missing unless you try something else and you feel it for yourself. Yep. You know? It's not like an empathetic feeling where you can see somebody, um, you know, someone, someone else's grandmother dies and you feel bad. You know, it's totally different than that. You have to actually physically do it. Feel it. Yeah, it's something I feel, I feel just really grateful to like be – the dance being a part of my life for so long really gave me a deep sense of like a connection to my body and I feel like – a lot of people just don't have that. I mean we're a little bit biased and skewed because we're from like a group of people who are extremely physically active. Like dancers, whether you eat well or not, like you're, you're doing a lot of physical activities. You're going to be more connected to your body than the average person. But I can't imagine how you know, someone feels who sits behind the desk all day and like just the level of coordination. Like there's this uh, – there's this handstand test that they do where it's just a handstand where you put your hands against, you know, up against the wall and you kick your feet up and you're basically leaning your body against the wall. So it's an assisted handstand with a wall, right? And it's incredible how many people can just and who don't even look like they're out of shape, but just cannot do it. Like they have no stability, shoulder stability or anything like that, you know? Really? Yeah. It's pretty amazing, man, wow. especially when you look at people who work in office jobs and like, you know, are sedentary. Like sedentary lifestyle is probably the worst possible thing, you know. Oh, of course. That for for you. I think sitting is is really really detrimental. Um, yeah, absolutely. And there's been well, a lot of studies not, and stuff. Not sitting at you damn for 8 hours, but yes, sitting when it comes to just period, yeah. Just yeah. Too much, man, like Yeah. I mean, at one on one level, it all comes down to like energy balance at a, to a certain extent. So you know, depending on how active you are compared to how many calories you're taking in, like you know, that's gonna that's gonna result in a certain amount of weight gain or weight loss. But then there's other factors like hormones and all these different things. But pretty much, you know, sitting. If you're someone who's spending more time sitting than moving, it's it's not good. It's not going to be good over the long term. So what do you think about uh, mindfulness and meditation? Is that part of your routine? Are, are, like, are you into it? Where... Yeah, I'm definitely into it, but I'm in and out with it. Um, I've, I've, and I've definitely seen the effects, but I'm, in terms of like static meditation, where I go into my room, light a candle, turn out the lights, and, and sit there and, and just calm myself, Mm-hmm. Um, I used to do that a lot. I don't as much anymore just because I'm just busy with my mind. It's, I want to be busy thinking about the things I want to do, so I, I leave that. Um, that's kind of like always going. But I do catch myself slowing myself down and catching and, and, and studying my breath through like if I'm driving in the car. Um, there are times when I, I'm always mindful. I'm always literally so self-aware. Gary, me and Gary B have a competition because he thinks he's the most self-aware person in the world. I think I'm the most self-aware person in the world. <laughs> yeah. And I, that's my, I love him. He's super motivating. He's, he's dope to listen to. I, I love everything about what he does. Um, and, yeah. Let me ask you, so let me ask you a question yeah. then, not to talk about Gary Vee, but like, you, okay, so a lot of people aren't naturally that in self inquisitive where they you know they really question their beliefs and and what they feel and how they actually think about things you know there's not everyone has that natural tendency to do that usually people have to go through some type of traumatic life altering experience or just some type of thing going some type of event in their life that makes them stop and realize that you know life is fragile and starts making them think deep more deep about these certain things Um, a lot of people, it ends up coming when they're older, you know, people get older and then all of a sudden they want to, they go on this quest to become wise all of a sudden. And what do you think, like, what was the starting point to where you became interested in like your internal world too, as opposed to your external world? Cause I think that's something that, yeah. Yeah. 
as long as I can remember. Um, uh, dude, always. I didn't understand how anybody my age thought ever, ever. Yeah. Uh, back in middle school, I remember when we first had AIM. You remember AIM? Yeah, I remember. All, all I did was play psychologist with all my friends. Yeah. Wow. Always ask me for advice. Well, how would you do this? How would you do this? And I don't know why I knew certain things and why I felt a certain way, but um, I don't. I think it was from my just from my sports and my dad. I just wanted a good head on my shoulders, and I just I watched a lot of interviews with professional athletes, and I would listen to what they would say. Um, so that inspired me a lot. I remember I watched a, an interview with Brett Favre, and, and a lot of things that he said just resonated. And um, it, I was just always about trying to do the right thing all the time mm-hmm. and just trying to find that what what else what's more like it's not just it's not whatever there's got to be more answers there's got to be better ways to think about things there's yeah. got to be just everything and I didn't understand why people want to be so simple yeah 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 man it's uh yeah with me it was a little different like I was uh I spent a lot of time throughout junior high and high school getting bullied because I was really overweight. So I kind of got into this really unhealthy cycle of eating and all this type of stuff. And I, and I was really, I was really numbing myself and not dealing with the actual issue. And then once I did, and once I actually changed my diet, changed my lifestyle, and started focusing on that, then I got super obsessed with it because I, I basically became obsessed. I have this obsessive tendency to go to dive so deeply into whatever I'm doing that it just, it's all encompassing. So when I started playing guitar, like, you know, I locked myself in my room for like six months and just practiced all day, which caused me to gain like 60 pounds and (laughs) create the whole weight problem to begin with. But basically I came to that, that place later and it was after going through something like losing weight that made me think deep more deeply about myself and then has really caused me to go on this journey since then since I was probably 17 or 18 where it's never stopped I've always been like seeking out more and seeking out more wisdom and stuff so it's interesting to hear that you've kind of you got that much younger and it's interesting to see how your progression's been because of that you know yeah yeah I don't really remember this thing I just remember that I, I would sit there and be like, how are you thinking that to other people? How are you not able to see it my way? And that's something even I have to deal with myself in terms of um, relaxing and understanding that everybody comes to a certain place in their own time. Yes. You can only do so much and you shouldn't force people to, to see things your way. Yeah. Regardless, because... They might be, they might be quote unquote better, and I do think that certain ways to do things are better than others. Mm-hmm. However, it doesn't mean that that's going to work for everybody. And so I had to swallow that pill a little bit when I started meeting more more people yeah. in different. Actually, when I started traveling and, and meeting different cultures, right? It really, it really did. I already had an open mind, but what it did is it made me just learn more. That taking that open mind and understanding how other people live and how other people think made me relax in my own um, criticism of other people. Sure, sure. I mean you're opening up you're you're opening up your heart more, you know what I mean? Like you're thinking less critically and logically about it and you're just seeing more things with empathy and yes. chalking it up to say, okay, well this might not make logical sense to me, but if I can get to a place where I can feel like a connection to this other person and see them as just me in another life you know, it, it allows you to, to empathize and be able to accept people and understand on a deeper level, you know? Yes. I think empathy is, is one of the most important uh, characteristics of a human being. And that's what I wish most people would work on with themselves the most. Yeah. Uh, more than discipline, more than, more than anything. Honestly, empathy to me is the most important thing. Yeah, I agree, man. I agree. I, I agree. And it's and part of the reason that we can't do it, or not we can't do it, but part of the reason why it's so hard for us to do in this society. Well, yeah, he, definitely because he, he's definitely not helping things for sure. But we're so uh, we're so ego driven here, and when you're so ego driven, when you're so focused on achievement and you know the industrial nature of like the American person. Um, 
you get really caught up in all of these things, all of these tasks, all these things you're trying to do, and it becomes about me, 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 you know, mine, 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 mine. And when you're able to like see other people as just you living another life, I was listening to this person talk today and they were like, they said, uh, everyone just comes to every situation and they do whatever seems most sensible to them at the time. And that's literally what, ev- what everyone's doing. And it, it puts it so simply because you can even use that with Donald Trump and, and with some of the crazy ass shit that he's trying to do. Um, whatever side you're on, you know, objectively, a lot of the, some of the stuff he's doing is crazy. So I don't need to <laughs> explain myself. But um, you, if you, even, if you look oh, yeah. at, even if you look at that, you can see that if you were, if you were to step inside of his head right, and look out through his eyes in his life – Everything he was doing would make perfect sense to you. Oh, absolutely. People wouldn't do anything any other way. Yeah. You know? However, what's interesting to me is something that you said about uh, the ego-driven. Obviously, here in America, we're very ego-driven compared to a lot of places in the world, for sure. Yeah. Um, we witnessed that firsthand, just the way we treat uh, just small communities. Um, but that's very interesting that you said that because I was obsessed with achievement my entire life, especially, dude, I almost got kicked out of Boy Scouts because I was progressing too fast. Shit. Who gets kicked out of Boy Scouts? <laughs> I remember, I was, that's funny, I, I literally just joined, and my friends joined, and I was, I had this big, thick Boy Scout book, and it was like 500 pages, I remember it was so big, bro, I read through that thing so fast, and I did everything to get every badge I could as soon as possible, and my, you know, the, the troop leader was just looking at me. He's like, you're not understanding the point. I was like, what do you mean? I'm getting all these badges. He's like, you're missing the experience about it. Mm. And I never understood it while it happened. Ooh. But I was so, yeah, I was so driven to just achieve, 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 achieve that I was just, yeah, I, that's all it was. However, that didn't take away from me empathizing with anybody. Right. I still was able to connect in that way with people. I love people. I love seeing you know their experience and having friends. And I don't think that ever undermined my achievement, right. like my empathy. You know, so that's interesting that you say that because I have a completely different experience. Um, yeah. I don't know how I. I don't know how I balanced it, and I don't know how I looked at at things. And, and obviously, I still probably put myself first in certain situations. Um, but I don't think putting yourself first is a uh, lack of empathy. No, no, and that, I wasn't. I wasn't meaning that. I'm more so meaning uh, when you're when you're so caught up in. Maybe actually, what I mean is we're so caught up in this culture with feelings of scarcity. So it's like we have this strong impulse in America to try to build as much for ourselves as we possibly can, and that more is always better, and. I think that's something that's pretty deeply ingrained in our culture, and maybe that is what's contributing a lot to people not being more open with each other and more accepting and more being able to communicate because everyone's on their sides. And then, and then when you throw on top of that this whole narrative of this two-party democracy, and then you throw on top of that all the rhetoric on both sides and then the identity politics and how like – you can see perfectly like why we're in the situation we're in, you know? Oh, absolutely, for sure, because people don't find it for themselves. They listen to other people. Yeah. That's the biggest thing, and, and that's the, really the biggest thing, and that's what I that really, I, I, you know what I really attribute a lot to? Um, my dad's an immigrant. You know, my dad and my grandma, they came over here on a boat from Sicily uh, when he was a little kid, and so even though um, he, you know, is fully Americanized, and he doesn't even have an Italian accent anymore, he speaks the best English. Um, yeah. I still, he loved his culture and where it was from, so I always had an open mind to to Italy, to the world. And also, I attribute a lot of my empathy and my love for other countries traveling to playing soccer. Hmm. Playing soccer and understanding that it's the biggest sport in the world. Yeah. And, you know, when the World Cup used to come by, how teams, even though they wanted to, you know, beat each other, it was, it was the worst level that some countries have for each other for how hard they work in their sport yeah. that made me so open-minded about I wanted to travel to Brazil I want to go see Argentina just because of their soccer team you know and when I was able to get up to a lot of these different 
different countries in the world. I was so excited to learn about them for what they were that it made me form my own opinion. I didn't care what anyone else said, and I, you know, I would listen for advice. You know, don't, don't go to the favelas in Brazil. Cool, like thank you for that advice. But you still need the experience yourself to form your own kind of mindset without any biased news and biased opinions. Right. Because there's so much of that out there that when people actually get out and get to go themselves, they change. You change as a person. When you travel, you change as a person. A hundred percent, man. I th- I think about. Uh, the month I spent in Europe teaching a couple of years ago and just being and I traveled totally by myself. It was the first time I ever spent a month alone. And, and like I was around other people, I was teaching, you know, like there's people taking your class and stuff, but when you go back to your hotel, when you go back to your Airbnb, like you're by yourself, you know, and you're by yourself and more and it was one of the most rewarding experiences because it's all I really felt like I was playing a video game. Like I really felt like I stepped into a virtual reality thing where I, all of a sudden I was planted in somewhere else and I could be whoever I wanted to be. And it was really interesting, my interactions with people because of that because I was very – I felt how vulnerable I was and not in a bad way, in a, in a way where I was like truly open to different experiences in the world for the first time. I think travel is something that everyone should experience for sure. It's like – No. And also, it's, it's your mind, but here's the thing though, it's your mindset going into it. Yes. And the bad experiences it, often become often become the most amazing memories because they're, sure. you know, it, it's where you have to dig deep. Like when you travel, like you, you can have issues where, okay, the entire country goes on strike and no trains are, are running, but you have to be the next country over in a day and you got to figure it out. And that's like, that's where you can really grow as a person, you know? language. I was going to play soccer, um, and when I played in Europe, my dad dropped me off. He stayed for a week, and then left me there. Wow, and that's amazing. I was like, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't at all. I was so excited. You know, I'm playing soccer, I'm training professionally. I'm, I'm living in Italy. Like I'm 17 years old. You're living what a dream. Yeah. Live, yeah. So the thing is, you have to think critically because no, now no one else is going to do it for you. Yep. So when you get – if you do get lonely and like it, it, the key is not not trying to fight it away. The key is just letting it happen. Like just be lonely and be in that and appreciate the fact that you can feel loneliness. You know what I mean? It's like – it's just an amplifier of the whole life experience is what travel is, you know? Absolutely. And, I, and the thing is even with that, that makes you get out and meet other people somehow. Yes. Because you don't want to be super lonely. and. And I think I've dealt with that all the time because when I used to practice soccer, I used to be by myself. I didn't have a lot of people to practice with because nobody wanted to practice as much as I wanted to. Right. After like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, they're like, all right, cool, I'm going to go home. I'm like, all right, cool. I stayed there for another two, three hours, dude. Yeah. Just practicing, practicing. And so I was always used to being by myself anyways. I would make up stories about like, you know, I was in, I was in the field and playing a certain game. So I was able to entertain myself with my imagination pretty well um so that's why even that loneliness I, I i don't really get lonely or bored that easily because i always keep my mind busy with 
do or something I've done before that I'm thinking about and appreciating. What do you do? You think uh, so? If you feel, if you think back to when you were like meditating regularly, did you have trouble, you know, keeping your focus on your breath, or did you find yourself being taken away by like just crazy, you know, tons of thoughts all the time? Or it can do you can you like slow your mind down, you know, or or is it always I, running I really can't, fast? No, I I can't slow my mind down. Um, of course, like anything in the beginning, the practice is difficult um, because it's not in our culture in America to meditate. Right. Um, so slowing our mind down is not the easy thing to do. However, because I was so disciplined growing up, it wasn't that hard for me to switch over and shut my mind. And it wasn't, you know, when I meditate, I don't really shut my mind off. No, I that's not the point thoughts, of it, I don't think. Yeah, I, I let my thoughts go and I go with them and then I just try to just be. And that's when I stop thinking. Mm. So I try to almost exhaust my my. my my initial thoughts of, okay, this, that, and thing, and then I just focus on my breath, and as soon as I get to my breath, and I, I don't do it right away, because I feel like if I do it right away, that's when I get distracted. Right. If I try to focus on my breath right away, and I don't kind of like have that little four or five minutes of me just letting things wind down, okay. I won't meditate for that long, because I'll get antsy. But when I kind of let my mind wander, boom, boom, and then I kind of wind down and then start focusing my breath and slows down and I just relax and relax that's when I can sit there for a while and just be just be totally I've been uh, I've been meditating regularly like pretty much every morning for 20 minutes and sometimes at night for you know 10 uh, for for probably the last like six months now, like for the first time in my life, it's the most most regular meditation I've been doing and what I've noticed and I don't know if you've had the same experience, but I've noticed, this uh, and I've also been listening to like all these podcasts on mindfulness. Like I've really been immersing myself in it, so that's probably another reason for this as well. But I've noticed this background, like low, kind of in the background of my experience, non-attachment to anything going on around me. It's almost like on a certain level, I'm able to maintain the state of being a passenger on the ride that is my life while still while still being just as engaged, while still doing everything that I need to do, while still putting all the same effort out. But for some reason, it's like it's not, it's not a big deal. Like I'm just kind of riding along, you know? That's amazing. Can I don't, that level, that, I mean, that's amazing. It doesn't, it's not all the time. It's not all the time, but it is something, it, 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 there is, there's this knowing that's kind of like deep in the background that I can, I can access. And sometimes I'll get caught up in emotion. Sometimes I'll get worked up about something. But more often than not, I'm noticing that I'm able to almost immediately say, be mindful, be present, you know, be with whatever's happening, don't attach yourself to it. And it's cool, but uh, it's, it's pretty amazing when you get to that, that place. And it's not saying like I'm having these crazy, you know, enlightened states or anything like that, but I think it's just like anything else. It's practice, you know? And, um, yeah, and I think even just the practice of it that's allowing you uh, to think about when you do get emotional. Yeah. That's why I think maybe you are dealing with things a little bit better. Like, even just knowing how you were before and some of the things that happened to you, to like your personality now and mm-hmm. like your open mindedness to it. Yeah. It's because now you can deal with those different emotions. Yeah. A lot of people push them away. They yeah. don't want to deal with them, they don't want to think about them. Yeah. And I think, you know what? I think why I'm so empathetic is. And, and kind of like I can deal with a lot of situations and I can talk to a lot of people about their, their different experiences is I used to walk a lot. I still do. For some reason, I used to love going for walks. I would put my music in or I would just walk regularly and I would walk around my neighborhood like three to six miles. I remember the little little circle I used to make back at home. And whenever I needed a second, I would take 20 minutes to, to 45 minutes and just walk. I would love it. And on that walk, I would just think about my life. And I used to do this like every other day. Dude, so you've been so you've basically been practicing mindfulness since you were a little kid inadvertently before you even really knew what it was. It's just been something that's been natural. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that would happen, I would go on a walk if I was sad, if I was mad, if I was happy, I would go for a walk and I would think about it. I'm like, why am I sad? What happened and what can I do better to stay away from the situation or what can I do to invite the situation more? Um, how can I, you know, and it would start from, it, as a kid, you start from, like, how do you deal with girlfriend problems? Right. And how do you deal with your 
friend problems then how do you, you know, what happened to the last game and, and the last soccer game that you had right and I would just really try to yeah just study why I felt a certain way but I, I think what ha- helped the most is I figured it out on my own mm. I didn't go I didn't ask him to feel for advice mm-hmm. I wanted to deal with it deal with it and not that there's anything wrong with that because I still think that asking other people's opinions and having discussions is just as enlightening as thinking about it yourself sure um because it can, oh, it can give you a different point of view. However, I don't think that advice just itself is enough. If you don't dig in yourself, you are never going to understand why anything's happening to you and what it's doing to you. It's it's um oh, so there's a <laughs> there's a book by Chogim Trumpa. Chogim Trumpa was uh, I don't know if you know who he is or not, but he was one of the people that brought Buddhism to the West uh, in the early, I think the late 1960s. So basically, his story is pretty crazy. He was uh, a, basically in his tradition in Tibet, there's people that are born, and whether you believe in reincarnation or not, like his his tradition, he was born, he's a very special, a special person, right? They put a lot of emphasis on him and they trained him very early on, on Buddhist and Tibetan like meditation, mindfulness, and traditions. And when China invaded Tibet, he had to flee with his family and everyone else to the UK. And he eventually came to America and he brought really a lot of the first – like during the 1960s, whole Woodstock, like peace and love, spirituality, Eastern movement – um, shortly after that, he started teaching in the West, and, and he has this quote where he said, to go down the spiritual path is a wise decision, but if you can help it, don't. Because once you start down the path, you can never stop. And I really believe in that. I think like once you, once you peer behind the veil of what is, is pushing you, what is making you tick, like what's deeper within you, you can't not – seek that out and it's like really a, I, I think it's a lifelong journey I think it's something that we'll be doing till the day we die like we're, ne- we're always going to be seeking and trying to think deeper about ourselves and it's something that I feel like if more people if more people were aware of or invited themselves to you know take part in it would be really transformative for the world but the tough thing is a lot of people have a lot of baggage and that baggage comes with a lot of fear and that fear causes them to, to close off and they push things down. And like you said, rather than push things down, when they come up, you should, you, know, you should deal with them. But that's hard for people to do when they've spent their last 20 years, 25, 30, 40 years of life living a certain way where maybe they grew up in a family where they never talked about their emotions, right? Or maybe they grew up somewhere where it just wasn't okay to talk about whatever it was okay with. So that's a tough thing for a lot of people to do. What do you think if there was like one thing you could – you could tell people who don't, you know, have never like thought deeper about who they are or maybe don't, you know, are in a rut and they don't understand exactly like how they tick. Like what's one thing that you could say that people could do to kind of start peering behind what makes them tick, to start understanding themselves on a deeper level? Oh man, that's hard. Yeah. Um, it's a large question. It's, it, I mean, it's, there's no right or wrong answer, right? But it's like... I, I think that I think not being afraid of how you feel. Mm. I think when you're afraid of how you feel, you don't want to talk about it. You yes. feel stupid. You feel like you shouldn't feel a certain way. Um, and you feel like that for a reason. It's going to be temporary, but you feel like that and it's very legitimate to you. Mm-hmm. Um, now, whether it's from a place of genuine feeling or... Like, for example, when you have a kid and they're making up their emotions because they want to get something. Right. You know, you can sift that out right away. We still do it as adults. But when you're genuinely sad because of a situation, you're genuinely sad. Whether someone else thinks that's right or wrong to be sad about, that doesn't matter. Because to you, it's a very real thing to feel in that moment. Yeah. Um, But because of judgment from other people, you push that aside. But instead of pushing it aside, maybe you just don't bring it up to them, but you need to go home eventually, whatever, at the point of the night, at the point of the day, and think about why you felt that way and understand what puts you in that state. When you can understand what puts you in those certain states, you can either, like I said, do more of it or do less of it. Right, right. And I think... when, when When you find that balance, I think that's what kind of like creates that confidence 
yourself because no matter what anyone says about you, like you gotta you gotta just find a way to get a little bit. It's hard to be in your southern tongue, but like that thick skin because no one likes to be made fun of, no one likes to be picked on, no one likes to be in certain situations. But if you can kind of just learn to rub it off and realize that that's a reflection of themselves not liking themselves, right, and not you. Then you can kind of deal with it better. It's, it's a hard thing to do. You know, I one of my biggest things in life is I hate bullying all the way around. Um, and it, it's a really bad situation for everybody involved. Yep. Because not only is the bully, you know, really doing something detrimental to the person they're kind of picking on, that's going to start them at the same time. Yeah. You know, they don't they don't realize it at the time because it's maybe it's an alpha male thing, maybe it's an alpha female thing, who who knows the reason it's but that's gonna come back to them at some point, whether that's a group of people saying that they're wrong for their actions and right. they need to, you know, uh, change how they are. Who knows what it's gonna be, but both parties are going to be affected. Absolutely. And, and sometimes and sometimes we and I'm sure you experience this and there's these moments, and again, it's also it's it's also trying to not take everything so personal. Yep. Um, it's a really hard thing to do, but when you this, so there's a situation, right? Say you and me are sitting in a room and we're talking to each other, and I say something to you, and you get super offended by it. That moment might play over and over in your head for the next ten years. Yeah. But to me, I didn't think it was a big deal. So I never think about it again. Yep. So I'm over here fine from it, and you're over there holding so much weight onto something that maybe I didn't even need to say. Yeah. But that's a very real thing. And think about that. That's why a lot of kids grow up and they can't get certain relationships straight because of old um, behaviors that used to happen that they can't get out of their head. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even myself when I was a kid, there's certain things that I that are triggered where I'm like, oh wow, you know, I can deal with it now and it really doesn't bother me more before I think about it and he used to put me in a, a bad mood or he used to put me in a weird mood because, well, you know, before this happened to me. And it's a very real thing, but that's because a lot of times people don't deal with it and think about it and kind of overanalyze it to the point where it's not real anymore. It happened and now it's done. It's interesting you you put it that way because I think back when you said a couple things before, I'll just add a couple things because when you said, you know, I think people are afraid of their emotions. So I think the reason people are afraid because I've been reading this book uh, on mindfulness by this guy named Joseph Goldstein and it's like – it's really, really cool because it's such a comprehensive look at – the idea of – the Buddhist idea at least of what makes up your your mind and your, your subjective reality. And with emotions, it's really interesting. Like we suffer from emotions. So the reason why someone would be afraid of their emotions is because when their emotions come up, it's painful and they don't know how to process that pain and they get scared of having to go through that pain. But what people don't realize and when you start looking deeper at it and what I think you understand in an intuitive sense just because of you know your life is that number one, your emotions just like your thoughts, just like the circumstances of your life, just like every single thing that you experience is all impermanent. So nothing is, nothing is lasting. Everything is – Impermanent. It, it exists for a little while and then it goes away, whatever it is. Even the Empire State Building will one day not be there, right? So every single thing that exists is by definition – to exist is by definition to be impermanent. So your emotions by definition are impermanent. So once you understand that, you can stop identifying yourself and your, your personal identity to those emotions and the more you attach yourself to them, the more you suffer because of it. So – Understanding that it's impermanent allows you to detach from it and not – it not rule you so much anymore. And it doesn't stop the emotions from coming up. After a while, you might get them less and less. But what it does is when they do come up, it allows you to – instead of shutting your door to them and running inside and hunting, hiding under the covers, it allows you to invite them in for a cup of tea. It allows you to invite them in and like – and examine them just like you said, to look at them objectively and say, OK – why do I feel this way? You can kind of deconstruct the mental, the mental story and constructs and scaffolding that your brain is naturally, um, naturally assembled because of the fact that 
your brain is wired from two million years ago and it's always looking for something that's trying to kill you. You know? Yes. So it's yes. it's absolutely it's interesting. All that that's all hundred percent true and how it happens and feels like I'm gonna be around for a long time. I mean I'm I'm It's the only religion that's not a religion. And it's, you know, be- it's beautiful because it's compatible with literally every other religion too. So you could be a Jewish yeah. Buddhist. You could be a Christian Buddhist. You could be a Muslim Buddhist, you know? Absolutely. No. It's yeah. It's trying to comprehend the forest and the trees at the same time. It's yeah. It's everything, and it's crazy because the fact that you say that is when I was there, I actually went on. I don't know how I did this. I had never been mountain biking in my life. Okay, not once. I used to ride my bike everywhere, but I had a street bike. Right. Okay. My girlfriend at the time, her um, her mom's boyfriend was she, you know in Sicily one of the best mountain bikers, very very popular. And the kids 
were helping me too. They were so cute. They were giving me little pointers in the time. I was like trying to understand them. And it, it was, it, it ended up being really good because I got so much confidence from it that three weeks later, he was saying he was going to go up to Mount Etna, which is the major active volcano, a volcano that's in, uh, where is it at? Uh, Catania, Italy. Okay. Right outside. And he was, we're going to hike, we're going to mountain bike on the volcano and through all the trees and, the, and everything for like 15 miles. And me being the, you know, I'll accept any challenge that I am, that guy, I was like, yeah, I can do that. Holy crap. <laughs> it, dude, I don't know why I accepted that challenge because this was no joke. I was a rookie. Like, this is my second time mountain biking ever. And I'm mountain biking people that do this like for a living. So on a scale of, and, okay, so on a scale, hold on, on a scale of one to 10, one being, one being flat land, and ten being on the side of a ridge about six inches wide with a, a thousand foot drop on either side. How difficult is this volcano? Six to seven. All right, that's pretty fucking hard. That's pretty fucking oh, hard. Dude, you're you're flying downhill. Some of the uphills, literally, I didn't think bikes could do this. Mm. I was going straight up when I tell you. And you know how hard it is to pedal straight up? Yeah. The incline was, the incline literally, I, I'm not, I kid you not, was 60 degrees, 65 degrees. Jeez, and you're leaning forward and you're like, if you, you know, if you lean back even a little bit, like you're done. You are gone. You are rolling <laughs> for days, for sure. And, it, it, no, and, and, that, and the thing is, and it was a, a winter time there, and the leaves had all just fallen. So it's not just, I wasn't on rocks, I was on leaves. And the, and the thing is that the, the bike loses uh, traction every now and then because the leaves move. Oh, jeez. So, dude, I literally was, I mean, my forearms were on fire. I couldn't even hold the handlebars anymore at one point. And literally, we got lost like once or twice, so all the doubt we would, we would fly. I was flying going downhill, bro. I'm telling you, I'm probably going 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. Flying, bro, downhill. That's amazing. So we get all the way downhill, and then realize that um, we went the wrong way. We have to go all the way back uphill where we just came from. Oh. So I literally I was on a bike from I want to say nine a nine a.m. till two p.m. two three p.m. Wow. No, hold on. The sun was coming down because it, it was I want to say like almost sunset, so about. Four, yeah, around four. From nine to four. I did a full work day on a bike. Shit, man. How did you feel the next day? Just, oh, my God. The next day I was on fire, bro. <laughs> like, on fire. Every, every muscle in my body hurt. I but the imagine. reason I bring this up to say that is while I was doing this, it was something that maybe here in America, if someone offered me the opportunity, I wouldn't have stepped up and done it. But because I was in a place where I was so free, and I was like, okay. And the reason I would have stepped up and done it is because I would have gotten injured. Uh, I don't want to do it. I'm going to get injured for damn. Right. I opened up, and I saw when I was going through this bike, this biking journey, I had to you're by yourself. Even though you're with other people, it, it's really you because you're on the bike. If you don't make it, if you stop pedaling, you're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to carry you. Right. So you've got to keep going. You right. know, that mental thing. Uh-huh. So you have a lot of time to think. At the same time, we're going through Mount Etna, and it's all woods. You could hear a pin drop. That's how quiet it was. I remember I get to this one area in this forest, and it was beautiful. All the leaves had fallen off this area, so it was just just the tree, just the trunk itself. Mm-hmm. For probably a good, probably a good half a mile, you can see straight down. Wow. And I just remember I, I got off my bike. I stopped. I pulled my phone out, set my phone in my pocket. And I took a picture. I think I posted it on Instagram. And this picture is beautiful. I wish I could have recorded and you could have heard what I heard. Because that moment, I stopped and I was like, this is a moment I remember for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. That it was probably one of the most, that, and when I was on the, the Great Wall of China, were two of the most peaceful moments of my life. That's awesome, man. That's beautiful. And it's a, yeah. it was a culmination because, you know, you were able to be fully present in the moment and I think one of the things that makes you present is danger so like being on that mountain bike you know and then being in this beautiful place that's so you know silent and serene and you can really open yourself up to 
everything that's in the present moment. Yeah. Like it's almost as if your perceptions open up to the point because our brain's always focusing on what on on you know whatever is most relevant to us at the moment. And a lot of times we don't even have uh, conscious control over that. It's just automatically focusing us on certain things. And it's almost like when you're in that moment, the doors of your perception open to this extra sensory stage where you're taking in more information than just the sights, just the sounds. Like you're taking in almost the feeling and the emotion of this of the area itself. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's so hard, man, because, like you said, that's why it's a lifetime journey, because it knows, you're figuring something different about it every day, every experience that you take that kind of makes you think that way. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's like, it, it looks crazy, as soon as you figure something out, you'll have another experience that makes you think something completely different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, have you ever been in the sensory deprivation tank? Um, I have not. I have, my brother has. I think he's heard of it. You should. Definitely. And I, I think he's used it, and I think he's told me about it. And he's, he's told me how you go in. It's in the water. It's in the water, correct? Yeah, you're in. You're in about a foot of water. Float. You float. There's a thousand pounds of Epsom salt, so you float like you're on the Dead Sea. Uh, the water is the same temperature as your skin, the surface of your skin, so you can't tell where you end and the water begins. And it's pitch black and soundproof. So there's basically no sensory input whatsoever coming into your mind. I think you would really dig it, man. I think you would like go super deep with it um, and have some really, really interesting, you know, moments and thoughts and realizations. You should definitely check it out. I think there's one in LA. There's a couple in LA actually. Float Labs. I, I definitely, I definitely think that. That's, you know, it's like a hundred bucks, right? How much is it? For yeah, it's like about it's about as much as a massage, so probably eighty to a hundred yeah. bucks. And, uh, and it, how it, long are you going there for? I've been in for. I mean, I, the longest I've been in for is ninety minutes, but normally it's sixty. And sixty, I think, is a a really good thing. And most of the benefit you get from it is actually when you get out. Because when you get out, you've just had the last 60 minutes of your – basically your sense organs not working at all, actually being off. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an environment that's totally alien to us on earth because even when you're sleeping, your body is underweight. You, the effects of gravity are working on you. you know, your, your ears are still taking in the sounds in the room even though you're not conscious of it. And in this environment, literally there's nothing coming in. So your mind is almost in a certain way untethered from your body it's pretty pretty interesting mm. yeah I definitely want to do it I, I definitely want to do it I definitely want to do things like that for sure you should check it out um, dude. yeah sensory deprivation tank and also uh, cryotherapy yeah that's a like big that. one I want to I just wish it wasn't so expensive I understand I the benefits from it you know but I just do the ice I, cryotherapy I just do the good old ice bath Honestly, I think you get more benefit from the ice bath. I, I feel like the ice bath is more – it's a slower thing, so it lets your body assimilate to it more. A, a lot of people say the benefits of cryotherapy is really amazing too. But I think if you're doing ice baths, you're getting a lot of benefit. Um, yeah, I, I love it, man. But dude, we just, did, we just did an hour and a half. Did we? Yeah, hour and a half, man. Hour and 26 minutes. This was awesome. Yeah, dude, I think you have some good stuff. So let people know where, and we'll keep talking after we get off this. But let people know where they can find you. Let them know, like, where's your social media? Where can they find you if they want to hear more about you? So my social media, I just changed it too for um, uh, branding purposes. But it, um, Instagram, I use Instagram way more than Twitter. I barely check Twitter, but I still do have it. Uh, my Instagram is at James. J A M E S Combo C O M B O Marino M A R I N O. Um, that's the same for my Facebook. Uh, it's the same all the way around. That way, nobody gets confused. The same all the way around. Awesome, awesome. Well, James, thank you so much, man. And I'm really excited to post this. And thanks for being a guest.